Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 137, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. And me, Ravi Abbott. Now, every week on this podcast, we do bring you a special guest on the show. Um, someone was saying this to me over the weekend, they're like, you know, the thing that I really like about your podcast is the fact that you kind of document gaming history, and we are preserving these people's stories for like future generations, I suppose, aren't we? Yeah, and kind of talking to generations, the guests we've got today, uh, the guests are absolutely fantastic. So we've got Rob Hooson, who now runs Hooey Games, which is a kind of tribute to Hooson Consultants, yep. which was his father's company. Now, we've had Rob on the podcast before, but he was talking about his new revival and the new kind of Hooson. We wanted to know about the old stuff. So we've got Andrew on this panel, and it's fantastic. We get all stories about all the old school games that he used to do. Name some titles, Dan. Euridium. Everyone remembers that game from Houston Consultants, Cybernoid. Oh, yes. Uh, pinball Fantasies and Pinball Dreams, if you remember. They yeah. had the whole kind of pinball, pinball genre locked down, didn't they? Well, that was after Houston, wasn't it? When so Houston went under in 91, then he set up 21st Century Entertainment. Yeah. That was his next company. Um, very interesting guy with such a big background in British gaming. I mean, he had a column in Sinclair User that a lot of people remember in the 80s. Also wrote a book called uh, Hints and Tips for the ZX80 that a lot of people kind of regard as like the missing manual for the, the ZX80. Yeah, and he tells us really interesting stories about the old kind of video game markets, the Spectrum markets there and people trading software and the, and the kind of early days of the industry. Yeah, and then he actually did make a, a bit of a comeback with that book that it was kind of his experiences in the industry. It was Hints and Tips for Video Game Pioneers that came out a few years ago as well. So Andrew is such an interesting guy, and we have tried to get him on the podcast before. I mean, at the time we got Rob and Andrew wasn't available, but now we actually managed to sit them both down together live in front of an audience at Play Expo London. And this is actually the final panel that we're going to bring you from our, our sessions that we did at, in London at Play Expo a couple of weeks ago. But it is a really interesting one. I mean, particularly if you grew up playing, like, you know, the, the Spectrum and the Commodore 64 and the Amiga. But, you, I mean, you think of the pinball games. Oh. They come out like the Jaguar, the PC as well. I remember they, they, they were They were fantastic. And also we're going to have a lot of extra stuff. We'll announce it when it comes onto the YouTube page. Yep. We're basically going to be showing our extra Play Expo panels. But next week we'll be back to normal uh, with a, a real human guest. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I guess at Play Expo. Well, went human no, no. Know, on Skype. Uh, but, I mean, the thing about it is the panels that we've done so far have been really interesting, but it doesn't stop there because we have, of course, got another event coming up in a couple of months' time. It will be Play Expo Blackpool again in October. And something really cool is happening with uh, Blackpool. Like, at exactly the same time, we're having the 20th anniversary of the Dreamcast. So we're going to announce a wonderful little panel that we're going to have. Well, this is crazy because... You know, we, we keep saying it on the show week in, week out. It seems that pretty much everything that we grew up playing is suddenly celebrating anniversaries. And the Dreamcast, I mean, weirdly, because it was Sega's last entry into the console market, um, technically considered a bit of a flop in terms of sale num sales numbers, but it's legacy since then. I mean, pretty much everyone you talk to, the law was list of Dreamcast in at least their top five That's consoles That's one ever. of the main machines that I play at the moment, still at home. Yeah. I've got my Dreamcast, and the games on it were just so much fun. And I've got one of these frame meister things, and there's this beautiful little device called the Toro Jewel Box, which has come out, and it basically does VGA outputs, it does European SCART outputs into RGB, uh, it does video sync on the system and everything, and you'll be amazed at the quality you can get out of a Dreamcast. I think it's 480i that you can get out of it, so even on HD TVs, it just looks stunning. Well, I've got a VGA input on one of my Samsung TVs, and I run a VGA cable just from the Dreamcast itself, Yeah, which looks nice. Again, that is about 480, I think, but a lot of games are like, you know, oh, we don't work with this cable, so I imagine it'll get around that, hopefully. Well, ourselves, we are not the massive experts on Dreamcast. Nope. There's, there's bigger experts out there there and they are the Dreamcast Junkyard and if you don't know about the Dreamcast Junkyard you should check it out because Dreamcast Junkyard is a huge site just like Atari Age yep. but it has fantastic features in it they've got huge interviews that they've had they've got like the top games they've, they've looked really into detail at, at stuff but they've also got a podcast which is called the Dream Pod yeah so if you go to dreamcastjunkyard.co.uk check it out because that is like the number one resource for Dreamcast stuff. And they're going to be joining us at Play Expo in Blackpool because we're going to be doing, you know, celebrating such an iconic console's 20th anniversary. Um, so it did come out in 1998 in Japan, so yeah. that's why it's the 20th anniversary in November. Um, obviously, in the, the West, it was a year later. Everyone remembers that 9999 
day, you know, in America. But we are going to have some really big guests there as well, including some that we are flying in from other parts of the world to be uh, joining us. And there'll also be um, a whole Dreamcast area there as well, showing off some, like, you know, really weird Dreamcast hardware, unreleased games. And there is a really big homebrew scene to this day on the Dreamcast. Well, usually we have Joe as our expert for Sega, don't we? Yeah. But uh, this time, Joe's been demoted and we've got a bit of an upgrade. Uh, we're having DJ Slopes come yeah. on as well, so he, he can add a bit of extra Sega no- knowledge and uh, kind of trivia. So if you love the Dreamcast, uh, do not miss this. And of course, all the other stuff that happens at every Play Expo, all the arcades and the trading areas, are going to be happening in Blackpool on the 27th and 28th of October. Uh, tickets are on sale now, and we'll be announcing more of our panels, because we are going to be there all weekend again, and you'll find out more. And get your tickets sorted at theretrohour.com. And that is also the same place if you'd like to help out this podcast as well. Because essentially, I mean, just for the cost of like a cup of coffee once a month, you could help keep this podcast going. Totally. And at the moment, we are moving hosting services and the new site is in development as soon as I pull my finger out. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, we are getting to that time of year where, you know, it's crazy. I was just thinking before, it's the 1st of September tomorrow. Got to start planning the Christmas quiz again soon. (laughs) Yeah, and and we've been uh, modifying our logo a bit. Yeah, so there's some big changes on the way. Some stuff's coming. Um, And obviously, you know, your help into any runnings of the show is really appreciated. We've had a few people get in touch on Twitter and Facebook going, how how do we make a donation? It is dead easy. We actually have on the front page of our website um, and in the show notes every week as well, a little PayPal button, you can just click it, put your address in. It literally it takes like five seconds to do that, doesn't it? And uh, we also accept cryptocurrency if you're into any of that too. You'll find all of that just on the front page of our website, theretrohour.com. And just for making a donation of any amount, you will qualify for your place in history in the Retro Hour Hall of Fame. Just like Scott Ravenscroft, Patrick McGinty, Diane Williams, and our friend Ian Roberts, who all made donations into the running of the show. And you can find out more on theretrohour.com. Now, this is really cool. I love seeing original boxed games that are still in their shrink wrap. But you know when you get those, do you always feel a bit guilty opening them? Hell yeah. <laughs> you, you, you know, it's like, uh, it's like when you drive a car off the forecourt. It loses value instantly as soon as you've done that. It is true because when you open it, it's then not a sealed game. It's just a box complete game. Isn't yeah. it? And the value does go down. And I've actually, I've got a few videos on my YouTube channel. It was one a couple of years ago where I actually opened a couple of Atari Jaguar games that were still sealed. And the amount of hate I got for it, <laughs> even though they're like really popular games that you can get for like a fiver, you know, they're not rare or anything And that's like that. it. It's like, have you got this game? Are you going to keep it sealed and never play it and yeah. just have it as this item where you can actually take it out and get going with it like you bought it yeah so. <laughs> exactly yeah I bought it for a reason yeah but there is something nice about opening it and smelling the early 90s air again that's been sealed <laughs> in there so it smells like Spice Girls <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, smell that 90s rave scene <laughs> well this is um, an article on Kotaku now what they did is I mean this will make some uh, hardcore collectors cringe a little bit there was a game called Star Tropics that came out on the Nintendo uh, back in 1990, so they found a sealed copy of this. It has been sealed up in the shrink wrap for like nearly 30 years. What, what console was this for? Uh, this was on the NES, okay. so on the original well, Nintendo. So, so an old game, definitely. Yeah. Well, the thing about it is, it was made in Japan, but in 1990, um, Nintendo of Japan were trying to move over to the Super Nintendo and transition to the 16-bit yeah. console. So it didn't actually get released in Japan, only in America, where there was still, you know, the NES was still really big in 1990. I've never heard of it, to be honest. Yeah, well, Star I mean, Tropics. looking at it, I mean, yeah. I hadn't played it before, but I've watched the video that they've done. Essentially, it's a bit like an RPG game. It takes a lot of influence from Zelda. Okay. Um, so it's that kind of, you know, you think it would be quite suited to the Japanese market. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what's funny is, though, I mean, this game is actually quite, it's actually very rare to get boxed now, and it goes for, like, big money. But they're looking at it, and uh, <laughs> they made so many copies of this that Toys R Us were trying to get rid of it. And you look at it, and there's um, loads of price labels on the front. It goes from $50 down to 20 down to $0.90. <laughs> cents to to get the rid final of it. reductions, yeah. yeah. <laughs> $0.90 cents it was in the end. The thing about it is, what makes this game really interesting is, back in the early 90s, Nintendo were essentially trying to stop Blockbuster Video renting out video games. Okay. Now, I didn't know this, but in Japan, it's actually illegal to rent out video games to this day. That's really weird because Blockbuster were the the main people. I remember a lot of Mega Drive stuff, but actually I don't remember that much Nintendo, so maybe maybe there were a few items available or... Maybe they did it on the sly. <laughs> well, my friend used to rent out SNES games from Blockbuster, like okay, then I remember, okay. which, uh, you know, th- 
the Nintendo's they tried to sue them, but it, it didn't work in the end. So what they thought they'd do is they tried to use some pretty underhanded tactics. So if you remember, you often wouldn't get like the full game and the manual and all that in a box, would you, when you rented out a game from Blockbuster? Yeah. Often it'd be in their own box. Or like a photocopy yeah. version. Yeah. Well, that's what they did. Now, it turns out in this game... To complete the game, you actually need a letter that they included in the box as part of the manual. <laughs> but it looks really random. It's like just a letter that's written to like a family member. So you open it up and you look at it, and I bet a lot of people just like, what the hell's that? Crumpled it and threw it away. As it turns out, when you get further into the game before you get to the end, the game tells you that you need to dip this physical letter into water to read a secret oh, message wow. that's on there. <laughs> that's so cool. So that was kind of, it was a form of copy protection, essentially. But... <laughs> Obviously, when they photocopied the original letter, if they did, it wouldn't see that unless yeah. it had been dipped in yeah. water. So that was pretty cool. But I mean, how many of them exist today? Because I mean, I imagine... That is probably the coolest copy protection I've yeah. ever heard of, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I do love stuff like that where, you know, video games get you to do stuff in real life. I do think that is really cool. Uh, but apparently this copy protection completely failed. And after a month or so, if you rang Nintendo's helpline, they'd just tell you the code because they've got that many people bringing them up anyway. Oh, I can just imagine kids like, oh, wow, when they've taken that out. Yeah. I mean, especially then, 1990, that was, you know, pre-internet. Mm. Uh, the web wasn't around then. That was kind of, it'd be one of those tales that you hear in school playgrounds. I got this weird letter. I tried dipping it in water. It was a bit like, you know, just like, Chinese whispers, really. Or James Bondy kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah it would. I, if I'd have had that as a kid, I'd have thought that was the coolest thing in the world. But yeah, so there you go. There are many. I mean, the tale of video game history is littered with failed attempts at copy protection, but that is one of the coolest ones, I think. Oh, definitely, definitely. And the video is worth a watch. It's about twenty minutes long, um, but I'll put it in the show notes at theretrohour.com. And this is quite uh, a unique little handheld that you found. We've had a lot of people get in touch about this. Yeah, the Orb Gaming Retro Handheld Console, and this is available at Urban Outfitters as well. And uh, Which is a clothes shop, isn't which it? Which is yeah. a clothes shop, and they've also tried to sell these retro items. They've been selling Polaroid film, and if you want to buy the most expensive Polaroid film in the world, go there. <laughs> it's uh, crazy expensive. I wonder why, why they decide to stock that in like a, a general high street shop. It's, it's, it's a general hipster item, isn't yeah, it? Now. it Let's talk about this little device. So it's 18 quid at the moment, and it's an LCD um, kind of little screen, and it looks very Game Boy-y layout, yeah. doesn't it? Reminds me like the, the Game Boy Color looking at it, but a bit smaller. Yeah, and uh, it, it has a kind of 158-bit games included. Now, we couldn't find a games <laughs> list anywhere, and uh, we've started to look at some of them, and these are rubbish. They're like total... PD, but not even good PD. This is like, you know, one of those Japanese multi-carts that you used to get back in the days. It reminds me of like, you know, those little Tomy handheld games that you get. I I'll read you some names. Yeah. Couple Plants, Domain War, Where to Go, <laughs> Apache Overkill. <laughs> they all sound that really cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Matchstick Men, I think, is another one that's on there, isn't it? Yeah. There's Noughts and Crosses and Connect Four as well. Um, Give me water. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're not going to be getting Sonic or Mario on here. No, catch, yeah. catch chicken is probably the best you'll be getting. Uh, and it, it takes three AAA batteries um, that are not included, apparently. But yeah, I love how generic the description is. It's 8-bit uh, games. 8-bit so, games, yeah. yeah. It doesn't really tell you no, much no, about 8 it. Not 8-bit quality games. I, I reckon if you, there's a lot more nicer little handhelds out there, or even a second-hand Game Boy would be better yeah. than this. You know? Yeah, I mean, it's... Um, it, a lot of people are saying in the in the thoughts I've read about it and the you know the forum posts and stuff that essentially it's it's kind of a heart back to like the game and watch kind of games like mm, you know the, yeah. they're not going to hold your attention for Tiger very long. Games, kind of. yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's that's what I was thinking of and Tommy and Tiger. Um, if I was a kid and I got one of these, I'd be devastated. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you know, there will be some kid who wants a little handheld. You know, he really wants Nintendo Switch, and he ends up getting the Orb. <laughs> it's like so. I, I feel sorry for those Tetris. kids. In that <laughs> but you know, again, it's a bit of a novelty. It's fifteen quid. I can see Christmas is coming up soon. If you got one as a stock in Philly, you might be like, oh, yeah, great and play for Yeah, five yeah, minutes. and I can see like you know, in a, in a meeting at Urban Outfitters or whatever, they were like, it plays one hundred and fifty eight bit titles, and everyone's like, great, yeah, eight bits in. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah. So, yeah, I'm sure there is an audience who will appreciate it. Uh, but actually, speaking of really good 8 bit games, there is a remake of an absolute classic. And uh, it was on a very good 8 bit handheld system from the Game Gear and came out in the Master System as well Sonic Chaos. 
Sonic Chaos. Now I've got a Game Gear and I haven't actually got a copy of this, so it looks fantastic though. I never, I never knew about it back in the days because Game Gear was a bit of a, a niche thing, wasn't it? Yeah, so. I mean, uh, I didn't know many. I think I knew one guy at school who had a Game Gear, and he did have Sonic Chaos actually. But it was, um, it was a full eight-bit Sonic game that came out between Sonic Two and Three. Okay. Um, so it featured Tails in there as well, who was a playable character. I did read as well that apparently Sonic Chaos was the first game where Tails got, you know, he could really fly in it. So now in Sonic 2, he would if he if he died or something, he'd catch you up. Because Game Gear was based on the Master System hardware, wasn't it? Yeah. So And on the Master System version of Sonic, if you've ever played that, it's so slow and uh, there's no spin dash. And even, yeah, it's just like... But, but technically it was very good, I thought, though. It did look really oh, good. Oh, it was yeah. impressive yeah. for the Game Gear, so... Yeah, well, I mean, yeah. this game came out on the Master System 2. Um, essentially, I mean, if you play it on the Game Gear, uh, the main complaint that I've read about Sonic Chaos is how big the sprites are on there, on okay. that small screen, yeah, yeah. because it was designed for the Master System that you'd look at on a TV, but on the Game Gear, it's kind of zoomed in quite yeah, a bit, so yeah. it's quite hard to play. But as it turns out now, uh, there is going to be a fan remake of Sonic Chaos that actually upgrades the graphics kind of to Sonic Mania standards. Oh, wow. That's going to be amazing, because wasn't this the first time that Tails appeared? As well? Uh, well, it was in Sonic 2, so this was, like, like I said, between... But, but like in, on the Master System. On the Master System it yeah. was, yeah, and the, and the Game Gear. Uh, so this is actually, there is a trailer on YouTube that you can watch if you want to get a look at the graphics. Um, again, it does kind of upgrade it to look more like the 16-bit games. But, I mean, the colour palette and stuff on it, it does actually, you can look at it and think, yeah, I can kind of see the heritage from the Game Gear there. It's kind of got those quite vibrant, bright greens and stuff like that. So it does look different, I think, to the, the usual Sonic 16-bit games that we're all used to. And this game has been in production for about a year. Um, and the thing about it is it spent seven months working on a brand new engine from scratch. Wow. So they've essentially remade the Sonic engine from scratch. It's called the Crimson Engine. And they've really made this, you know, try to make it as close to original, authentic Sonic accuracy. These in Sonic game. fans are dudes, aren't they? They're like Absolutely. amazing at making games. I don't know kind of any other platform. I know there's lots of Nintendo clones and Mario weird versions. Never like this, though. Never like yeah. this. The full remake of the engine, and it's amazing. What I think is, though, it's the fact that Sega either... It, well, I mean, I was going to say they don't mind them, but actually, if anything, they encourage them, really, don't they? Yeah. Because you look at Sonic Mania, that came out of a fan project, didn't it? And again, I mean, I haven't played this, but the reason I'll put this in our show notes, uh, they've just released a downloadable demo that you can play for free if you want to try it out on a PC. Awesome. Um, to see what you think of it. Um, and I, I haven't really read it which platforms it's eventually going to be out on. I mean, it is a fan-made game, so I imagine they're not going to be selling it commercially. Um, but we'll keep an eye on that, and you can get the demo right now if you want to give it a try. It does look, though, like I said, I love Sonic Mania, and I think the more of these kind of games that we get just to bring Sonic back to roots because, you I mean, there's, there's been that many naff Sonic games over the years. Well, so. talking of remakes, you know, there's a, we always get these articles that always pop up and it's games that need to, retro games that need to be remade. And we click them every time. And we, <laughs> and we, and we fall for the clickbait every time, yeah. But um, they're talking about kind of, you know, the revival of retro games at the mo moment and remastering of stuff, HD versions. And they've got a little list here. So what do you think? A Alex Kidd in Miracle World? See, again, I mean, a Alex Kidd was kind of Sonic's mascot before Sonic came around, wasn't he? For a, for a, for a bit, at least, anyway. And, and that was the one that everybody had because it was built in. Yeah, to the Master System 2, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. And all my mates could only afford, like, one game and <laughs> the built-in game. <laughs> See, I think the time is probably right for Alex Kidd to make a comeback. I mean, it did get re-released on, like, the, the virtual console on the Wii was on there, too. Um, but I think, yeah, it would be good to kind of see an up updated Alex Kidd game. Maybe, again, a fan project. Yeah. It'd be good. There's got to be some fans out well, there. Well, there, there's a couple here that could be really good fan projects, which would be Super Mario World and, of course, Donkey Kong. But, yeah. You know, Donkey Kong, it was done so many times, wasn't it? Like, and... I, ish, I think this guy's not played Tropical Freeze. <laughs> well, that was very different to the original yeah, Donkey Kong, but, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, I mean, the original Donkey Kong game, is, it's a pretty simplistic formula. Um, but, I mean, the amount of Pac-Man clones that get re-released with amazing new graphics yeah. and new effects and stuff, maybe you could do something like that with those old games. I mean, I was playing... Donkey Kong in VR, where you have to run and you're a jump man yourself. That would be good. Yeah. <laughs> Watching the barrels come to yeah. mind. Yeah. Uh, I, I think there is probably something you can do with that. I've got like a, you know, the Namco collection on the Switch. 
And there are some like, you know, new versions of Gallagher on there that yeah. kind of all these like, you know, flying neon effects and all that. Kind of like Jeff Minter does with his like his new games. Yeah. So that look awesome. But Call of Duty, I know you play every Call of Duty release that yeah. comes out, so I, I don't think that should be on the list. <laughs> I'm, I'm <laughs> determined not to buy this year's Call of Duty. Uh, my brother's already like, oh, should we get it? I'm like, no, no, that's it. I'm done with it now. But they are saying here, I mean, it's the original Call of Duty game mm. that came out back yeah. in the day that, you know, might, probably the time might be right for that to get an HD upgrade. So I know they did with Call of Duty 4, didn't they? They got like a, an HD upgrade of that recently. Okay, Majora's Mask. Oh, that was a great game. Yeah, and uh, it's so expensive to get nowadays. <laughs> It'd be good to get a cheap version well, on I mean, Steam you know, or something. I'm not a massive Zelda fan, those are probably the two Zelda games I've played the most. You know, Ocarina of Time and uh, Majora's Mask on the N64. They're just very, they've got great atmosphere, those games. Well, we won't go through the full list because we've got another story coming, but let's go on a final one, which I know you want to see a remake of, which is Cannon Fodder. Oh, yeah. Well, that's the thing. I mean, back in the day, Cannon Fodder came out on so many systems and it was all pretty much identical. Um, you know, if you played it on like the, the CDI or the Amiga or the Jaguar or the 3DO, they'd all be very similar. But I think, yeah, that the timing is right for a remake of it. And they're saying here, the developers could add some additional sparkle with 3D buildings and landscapes, similar to Cannon Fodder 3. Now, did you ever play Cannon that, Fodder that, 3? That was awful, yeah. And... The thing is, like, if you look at squad-based games at the moment, yeah. XCOM is huge. XCOM, all the remakes of that, and that's still keeping with the original four guys. You can go off with one guy, do this, do that. And I think Cannon Fodder is uh, prime for that. But yeah. I reckon they'd rather go more down the silly route and turning it into a cartoony thing like they did rather than, you know, an actual... It was a pretty brutal game, you know, yeah. before, and it was pretty uh, serious, actually, when you played it, you know. You yeah, cared about your guys. Mixed and, messages yeah. in there and stuff, wasn't there? I mean, there was, like, the tongue-in-cheek stuff that all sensible games had. Yeah. Uh, but you're right, I mean, you know, there was, there was actually, you know, even stuff like the poppy on the front and the theme music and mm. the fact that you had the gravestones and all that. But I think you're right now, especially, you know, even on consoles, that every console's got an analog stick, which would be a lot easier for the control of it, wouldn't it, than trying to do it on like a, a Mega Drive pad? Yeah. Um, and playing it on a modern PC, that would be good. Next time we see John here, there you go. Plant, plant the seed. Yeah. He's done soccer, hasn't he? Let's get back to roots. Right then, final story before we get into our interview with uh, Andrew and Rob Hewson. Because um, a lot of people use Raspberry Pis in the retro community, obviously, for emulation. Yeah. What's this about powering it over Ethernet then? Well, this is cool. Like, I. I've worked as a technician and for a long time we've had, in all these new modern buildings, you have Ethernet everywhere. Yeah. And it's like, Ethernet? Okay, what? So I can just do LAN gaming in the whole place and it's like, no, you can send power over Ethernet. So this thing's called PoE and uh, they basically have a a hat, which is a hardware attached on top. It's basically a kind of add-on board that you can stick onto your Raspberry Pi and then you can power it through the Ethernet power. Now, Ethernet's crazy. You know, anything with Cat5 you can convert. So yeah. you, you can get these things called balums, basically. And uh, if, if you look at two links I've put here, there's one from Amazon, which kind of shows you a HDMI ballon. Right. So what you can do is you can have one Ethernet connection at one side of your house HDMI ballum at the other, and then send the video signal through your entire house. Yeah, through Ethernet. Through yeah, Ethernet. Yeah. But then you could get those home plugs. Which I have, yeah. Yeah, I, I got so, those so you could go HDMI into the home plug through the power lines in your house, out of the <laughs> Ethernet into a HDMI box. See, I'm moving in a, in a few weeks' time. You give me some ideas here now. <laughs> <laughs> I've already wanted to do that. I want to wire my whole new house up with Ethernet everywhere. And I've been looking for ways to do it. And actually, it's quite, you know, to get someone to come out and fit them is quite pricey. Yeah. But I've been watching, um, there's a guy called Callum Gray on YouTube who moved house recently and he shows like he fits Ethernet and cables up his whole house and it looks amazing I've been watching them my missus like don't you get any ideas <laughs> you can stay away from the walls with the saw so, yeah, yeah. Uh, just rip this bit out just do that Yeah, uh, we'll have to send her away for a girls weekend and I'll get you around <laughs> yeah. but the power I'll tell you the power of Ethernet is just fantastic and the length of it as well because it's like a really long length it can it can still take the video signals for that long and other stuff that you send over like huge lengths of wire needs like little extenders and stuff in it, but Ethernet's just like pow. 
Yeah, even the thing about getting power over Ethernet as well. I mean, it's uh, I know there is actually these little Ethernet killer devices that I've seen people oh, using yeah. mischievously, <laughs> yeah. which uh, a lot of school kids have been using them. You know, plug it into the Ethernet port of school and fries the computers uh, by putting the mains through it. There's actually some YouTube videos you can watch of like, you know, if you're into smoking motherboards, <laughs> they're always a giggle. So uh, not that we encourage that kind of behavior on the Retro Hour uh, podcast, of course. Right then, well, that's all the news that we've got for you this week, of course. Uh, do keep in touch throughout the week. If you've got any stories you'd like us to talk about as well, I mean, uh, it's always appreciated if we get any tweets in at Retro Hour UK or join us on Discord. You can leave a little, you know, if you've seen something cool in the week. I think yeah, or even if you're listening to the Retro Hour kind of around the world, just uh, send us a picture, you know. Yeah. We've got a gallery section that's going to come onto the new site of like listeners, pictures and stuff. So that'd be really nice to have a few more to add. Yes, you can get us on uh, on Twitter at Retro Hour UK or on Facebook or just through our website, theretrohour.com. And that is the place that you'll find all the stories that we've talked about this week. And now it is time for our special interview all about the history of Houston Consultants, 21st Century Entertainment and into the modern day with Huey Games, recorded live at Play Expo in London last month. Andrew and Rob Hewson. Please give a warm welcome to Andrew and Rob Hewson. So Andrew, we'll, we'll start with you. What first got you into computers and video games? When did you first encounter them? Well, of course, I'm a... Huh. I'm a child, uh, was born a long time ago, and so, yeah, computers, I were at school, at school in the sixth form, I wrote some assembly code to calculate the cosine of an angle in assembly code, and the code had to be punched on 80 column card, do you remember that? Uh, and sent off to Chelmsford, which was about uh, 10 miles from my school, uh, to be compiled and run on their computer. And then the next week, of course, got the printout, uh, which came back, which said, basically, your program failed. <laughs> you had to wait a week then to find out. Had to wait a week. Wait a week for, to... Um... So, uh, as you can imagine, um, that program never actually ran. You know, in the term or so that they were doing this, this was after hours uh, at school, uh, that program, ne I never got it finished. Well, Rob, growing up, you must have kind of been surrounded by games and stuff. Were you like the most popular kid in the schoolyard? Uh, definitely, yeah, no. Um, I do remember, I certainly remember growing up with, uh, with that all around us. Um, it was the Commodore 64 that Dad decided to bring home for whatever reason. I'm guessing someone gave him one for free or something like that. Uh, so I remember playing, no, you're objecting to that. <laughs> I can no, see. we just had a lot of them knocking around the, the, the uh, building. Yeah, but they were given to the building for free, probably. Maybe. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, so I remember playing Gribbly's Day Out and um, Iridium. Those were my first memories of, of, of playing games and, you know, sticking planets up around the screen and pretending I was in space and me and my sister playing those games. So, yeah, it was, it was, it was good fun. Well, how did Houston Consultants start then? Well, I'd been... Uh, uh, my career was a bit of a failure. I was, a, I was a scient in the scientific civil service and... Um, uh, I didn't uh, like where it was all going. I ended up working as a, a, a statistician, working on flood statistics. Anyone here interested in uh, flood statistics? Uh, no hands going up. That's a surprise, isn't it? I was working on, uh, I was on, working on flood statistics, and of course, um, the ZX80 uh, came out, and this is a time when nobody had a computer. Computers were really exciting. Uh, and the ZX80 came out, and I can remember uh, reading about it and thinking, I'm going to have one of those. And what's more, I'm going to make some money. Because I wanted to make some money. As I said, my career was really going around. It's, oh, well, I thought it wasn't going anywhere. Um, uh, and uh, that was it. So I bought a ZX80, uh, uh, set it up at home. I went to the bank uh, and explained my project to the bank manager, a nice chap, old chap, probably then about the age I am now. Uh, and he, uh, yes, uh, he agreed to lend me £500. And he probably thought I was mad, and I probably was. So I spent uh, £30 uh, on an old desk uh, and uh, ordered the ZX80, bought a black and white television, a little one, yeah. uh, bought a cassette player, and took over the third bedroom in our house and, uh, you know, to make my office. And I sat around about fiddling with this ZX80. Well, the emerging microcomputer industry must have felt like something that was really exciting and 
untapped and did, it, did you see a lot of potential there? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, fortunately, my boss at work at the time, uh, I'd been uh, out and about. We'd been to Warrington, that's an exciting place. Uh, and we were on our way home, stopped overnight in Stratford-on-Avon. Uh, and uh, we, um, we went out for a walk. It was a, it was a June evening, something like that. We went out to, uh, for a walk in the evening and wandering through the town and there's a television shop and the television shop was showing a television with teletext. Uh, and of course, I was very rude about teletext, you know, silly uh, script on the screen, uh, uh, four colours, uh, just uh, nothing very much written on there. And I said, oh no, it's rubbish, look, stupid. The, the data, they've only got room to get the data in in the flyback time. Um, because not, you, can't carry, you couldn't carry much data on the, um, uh, uh, over across to the screen. So I was very rude about it. And my boss, no, I want one. I want one. He was really excited. He was really excited by the idea of buying a Teletext TV. Uh, and that would, that would be 1980. Um, and, that really, and, and I remember that. That was a real lesson. That was a real lesson how somebody could be so excited by something that were actually wasn't very good, but was nonetheless entirely novel, entirely new. And the fact that it wasn't very good, you know, I could be rude about it, didn't matter. And so when the ZX80 came out, I had exactly the same idea about it. I thought, loads of people are going to be excited by this, even though the screen disappears when it starts calculating something. <laughs> I mean, you know, this is rubbish. This is rubbish. How can you have a computer like that? Didn't matter, of course. Uh, what mattered was you could buy this and have it at home, and it cost you 100 quid, which is a lot of money, but you could nonetheless afford to have a computer in your home. Uh, and so, yes, uh, absolutely knew this was going to be a success. So I sat down with the thing, and what I did was actually just sit down. There it is in front of me, and I've got paper and fiddling about on the keyboard. Ah, oh, hard work pressing the keys. Uh, working out roughly how this machine was doing things, making some notes, work out a bit more, make some more notes. And of course, uh, my plan was to make a, write a book. I wanted to write a book. The reason I wanted to write a book, this is a bit of a side story, um, I was working for the Scientific Civil Service. That's what I did. And writing papers, you know, publishing papers, being published, uh, it's still vitally important to people in academia, even today. I wanted to prove to myself that I could write a book. And so this was a project for me to just do at home, write a book about the ZX80. Well, the, what's the background behind the name, Houston Consulting? Because it, it, <laughs> it kind of sounds like an it's accountancy rubbish, firm. Or what something. a rubbish name. You see, that's what I mean. You can, you, a rubbish name and you still get away with it. You can still get away with it. It's a time uh, where, in the development of a market when you get, and get away with all sorts of nonsense. Uh, yeah, a rubbish name. Why was it that? Well, I was, I was a statistician. I did some consulting work outside of work for other people who wanted some statistics done for them. There's the name. Sorry about that, folks. I apologise. Even today, I'm still slightly ashamed of the name. <laughs> well, I mean, you spoke about the writing then. Obviously, the ZX80 Hints and Tips books were a massive success. Um, what was the background on that book? The, uh, basically, the, the ZX80 book and the ZX81 book were both about sitting there, how does this thing work? Uh, because the, the, the book that came with it, I, and also this was true of the ZX Spectrum, the, the book that came with the machine, really, it told you, it got, told you enough to start fiddling with it, but it didn't really tell you how to play. There were lo there's loads to find out about it. So, um, uh, yeah, I wrote, as I say, I published a book about the ZX80, I published a book about the ZX81, published them myself, um, uh, by going along to the local photocopying shop and getting them to photocopy the thing and make it up into a book uh, uh, for me and uh, sold that by mail order. I imagine then as well, because it was such a new industry, you really did need a book to explain it because people hadn't used computers before. Exactly. You could really, you could tell them about anything, explain how the data was being transferred to the screen, how the... How the um, uh, how the system variables, as they were called, were used to control how the memory in the machine was being, being uh, used. Just what would now be regarded as absurdly simple uh, information 
that, that uh, actually people don't really need to know anymore because the machines do everything for you. Well, at what point did people start sending you games? And was Rob your like initial play tester? <laughs> uh, yeah, Rob actually wasn't born. Sorry about this. But the uh, sorry about this before. <laughs> Uh, the uh, hints, hints and tips for the ZX81 came out in 81. Uh, giving away your age, you know, he was like uh, on the way at that time. So, no, he wasn't the playtester, although he did get to playtest a lot of things later on, didn't you? Um, what happened was that, of course, I'd written these books. They'd gone in, uh, I'd sold them by mail order. I'd sold them into WH Smith. I mean, what a coup. Got, uh, you know, I, I mean, my book is in WH Smith. This is extraordinary. Um, and it was at that point that somebody rang me up from a distant place. I live out in Oxfordshire. Somebody ra rang me up from all the way from Croydon uh, the, uh, and said, uh, hello, I can't even run, uh, uh, written these books. Would you write a magazine column for us? Uh, because we're setting up a magazine called Sinclair, Sinclair User. Uh, obviously, I said yes. Uh, equally... Uh, not obviously to me, but obvious to them, was they sent a, um, a photographer all the way from, from London out to my house in Oxfordshire to take a photograph of me for the magazine. I was stunned. They're, honestly, I was stunned. Why are people doing this? They wanted a photograph to go in the magazine. So I started writing a column in the magazine um, called Houston Helpline. Uh, with my photograph, uh, uh, you know, that they'd taken standing in front of the... Uh, uh, fireplace, grinning like a lunatic. Uh, and again, the, the column was about, this is how you run. By this time, the ZX Spectrum will probably be the, uh, the machine. This is how it's working. This is what's going on. People used to send in letters. Yeah. Letters, can you imagine? Writing them, sticking them in an envelope, putting them in the post. Anyone remember how to do that? You can't imagine, by the way, what it's like to come down um, in the morning in your own house, down the stairs, uh, to the front door, uh, on the mat, there are envelopes, uh, and in, several envelopes, and you open the envelopes, they're addressed to you, you open them up. Inside is a cheque that somebody has sent paying you money. Uh, the excitement of that uh, in the morning, anyone, can anyone imagine that? That's, what ma that's how mail order used to work, you know, and that was really exciting, getting up in the morning. It's worth getting up in the morning just to see if there was a, uh, was a cheque on the, on the doorstep. The... But going back to the, uh, the helpline, yeah, and that, of course, put my name in front of the, uh, you know, users. I mustn't call them punters, sorry. Yeah, I was going to call them, I will call them punters, because we all are in the end, that's what we all are. Uh, and that put my name in front of people, because um, Sinclair User had a circulation of 100,000. So a readership of a quarter of a million, that's a quarter of a million people every month, uh, of at least some of whom are reading the column. Uh, and that put my name out there, and the link to the appalling company name uh, was very obvious. And so people started sending in, in games uh, for us to look at. Uh, and I was, I was writing a bit of code at this time, a bit. I, wasn't very, I was never very good at it, never very keen on it. But uh, we started receiving these things, and to be honest, it was a bit of an avalanche. It was quite difficult to deal with them all, because um, most of them were pretty poor. Of course they were. Uh, but in amongst them there were one or two gems and uh, the crucial people who we came across uh, uh, like that, Mike Mail, who wrote the uh, night flight and he threw air traffic control and uh, Southern Bell uh, for us. He came through that, that mechanism and of course uh, Steve Turner and because of Steve Turner, Andrew Braybrook, uh, you know, the Graph Gold team uh, came exactly that way. Uh, and to be honest, um, when you loaded up their, their, their cassettes and looked at, which took a t time of course, when you loaded up their cassettes and looked at the material, in, in both cases, very clear, these people knew what they were doing and had talent, which is what we looked for. Because that was the era of the bedroom programmer, wasn't it, where <laughs> everyone had a go at writing their own games at home? Yeah, uh, absolutely. And of course, there are still people uh, a bit, well, out there, there are people demonstrating uh, their work that they're uh, doing at home. Obviously, the difference uh, between then and now is that there's a whole industry that these guys are, uh, are attempting to compete against now, whereas then there was just huge demand. Can I talk a bit about the demand? Yeah, go Do you want to be, uh, um, Anyone here remember the ZX Microaffairs? There we have a hand up. Excellent. 
they were, the ZX microphones, this reminds me of it a bit, except that the people out there aren't looking to spend money. The, it, the ZX, ZX microphones were as informal as, uh, as you've got it here. Uh, if you can imagine the, the um, uh, upper Alexander Palace or down at the Central Hall in Westminster, uh, a six-foot table, not much bigger than this, your books there, cassettes, you know, somebody else is selling electronic gizmos over the add-ons, you know, memory, we had memory. Um, uh, and you're standing beha behind here, and over there are people with 50 pound notes. 50 pound notes, I'd never seen 50 pound notes uh, before the ZX uh, microfair. People with 50 pound notes going like this, handing them across. Please take my 50 pound note and give me you know, that 16K memory, and it wasn't that much, it was a bit less than that. But still, that sense of people wanting to spend money, there wasn't anyone anywhere else, there was no developed market, there were no retail outlets early on, that people are wanting this stuff, willing to spend the money, really excited. It's the excitement which you, which you can't quite understand, uh, um, because it's not there anymore, but it's a... Uh, an excitement, which is, there's a new market, it's exciting, I want to be part of this, it's fun. Well nowadays if you're a game developer there's hundreds of tools available for you, what was it like back then? Well nothing of course, nothing at all, uh, not absolute, everything, every tool that every developer used in the early days, uh, that person had written themselves. Uh, Steve Turner, for example, of Graph Gold, um, wrote from scratch, wrote his own assembler, didn't have an assembler, wrote his own assembler. He could actually write in machine code, if you know what I mean. He could sit there and write in hex, hexadecimal, uh, and write code uh, that uh, worked. So, obviously, the, there, was, there was nothing at all. Uh, and to be honest, uh, as well, the tools that were there, I don't think any of us realized that they existed in the sense that there were um, later on, later on, uh, there came into being, once the IBM PC developed to a, a sufficient stage, this is late 80s, early 90s, uh, where you could have a Z80 emulator running on the PC which would plug into the Z80 socket uh, so you could run an emulator on your PC. Um, did we realize that that tool would be useful to us? I'm not sure that we did. So even the tools that did exist, uh, I think uh, you asked John Hare whether he used those tools. I don't think he did. I don't think he did. He was probably programming on those little rubber keys on the Spectrum. <laughs> ah, lovely. <laughs> they, they, they were a real innovation. Those were good. Better than the ZX81. <laughs> Better than the ZX81. <laughs> I mean, Houston Games were always known for pushing the boundaries and doing exciting new things with the hardware. I mean, you mentioned uh, and Andrew Braybrook before, and like parallax scrolling in Iridium on the Commodore 64, that yeah. was unseen before. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, the great thing about uh, Iridium, yeah, you've mentioned it, the parallax scroll. Um, uh, Ur Iridium was phenomenal when we first saw it. It was absolutely stunning. Uh, and of course, the great, the great thing about it is it actually is a bit of a cheat, isn't it? Because there's the ship in the middle of the screen with this wonderful, smooth scroll. And there's a band at the bottom of the screen and a band at the top of the screen, which is a star field. So there's all the execution time is going into that bit in the middle. So, you know, but what a brilliant cheat. What a, and that's, that, that's an important thing about when you're pushing the hardware as hard as it can possibly go is actually finding the way to cheat your way to make this work. And it's a, it's, a, it's a nasty word, cheat, and I don't mean it in a negative way, I mean it positively. In order to create the effect that you want, you've got to be prepared to be quite, to sacrifice something else to get what it is you're going for. Well, how much of a family business was it then? Were you all involved? Uh, yeah, we were. I mean, you, you know, you know, my wife came in and uh, 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 helped with it. I mean, my brother was in it uh, in the early days. He dropped out about uh, 85, 86. You know, it got too much for him. 
Um, so, um, and yeah, later on when uh, Rob was go- growing up, um, I mean, it, uh, poor old Rob. I mean, it, you know, he's fated to move into the uh, games business. I told him not to, uh, <laughs> but he, um, the, uh, you know, his Im- ambition from about uh, eight or nine years old uh, was in games design, always drawing I- images of, uh, you know, this is, can you do this, Dad? Uh, no, can't do that, Rob. It, great, uh, fantastic, brilliant idea. So it was, uh, yes, my father was involved. We actually sent up a, set up a cassette duplicating company in 83, 84. Uh, we moved to a factory and, and bought the kit. Uh, and I, my father, I brought him, uh, you know, gave him his last job before he retired uh, because all, he'd always been, um, he was an industrial chemist. Uh, and I knew he could run the, ki- the, uh, the cassette duplication, and that's what he did. He ran the, uh, kept the machines going. Uh, really quite exciting times to be actually manufacturing uh, the cassettes uh, and packing them up and sending them out the door. That was one thing about the cassette medium, that it was very easy to duplicate, and I think the day that kids at school found out that tape-to-tape copiers could copy games, Piracy was very rife. I mean, did, did that harm you at all then? Did it, did, was it a big problem? Yeah, sure. Uh, I, I think um, you can be positive about it and say it spread the word, but no. I mean, you know, it took an awful lot of money out of, potentially took a lot of money. It gave a, it, it, what happened was we, uh, the developer and the publisher lost control uh, and the sort of rigid control that you have from Sony and Nintendo uh, these days is a direct result of the the loss of control that comes from uh, piracy so yeah big problem which system did you enjoy working with the most then at that time oh that i've never been asked that question before i mean they're all good in different ways i mean uh, you you can be negative about them all can't you uh the um, the the best 8-bit system, I would say, was the C64 from a game's point of view. Uh, you know, the wonderful music chip, the uh, sprite support, what have you. Um, so, uh, but, as you've already mentioned with uh, Iridium, really quite a slow machine, so difficult to get the best out of it. Uh, and I'm not altogether... The, 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 the graphics, the colour balance... Uh, I don't know about you, but the colours don't work for my eyes, uh, my eye as well as the more, um, uh, uh, what's the word for it? Uh, red, red, green, blue, the stronger colours. I like the stronger colours. Sorry, I can't express that very well. So, um, uh, and then of course when the Amiga came out, what a fabulous, uh, fabulous games machine. Uh, but in the end, it fell between two stalls. I mean, was it a computer or was it um, a games machine? I mean, Commodore always sold it as a, 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 as a business machine. Always. Commodore Business Machines. That was their name. CBM, Commodore Business Machines. Even though uh, everybody knew that people bought them to play games on. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, lovely machine, though. Well, how did Houston make the transition from 8-bit to 16-bit when the Atari ST and the Amiga came around? Was that quite a challenge? Yeah. I, well, it, 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 all, it, it was all a challenge. I mean, the, the, uh, the real difficulty was the, that we didn't know what we were doing. Um, the, the, uh, because that's what happens when, you, when a new market springs out of nowhere and you're relatively young uh, and you've got no business experience and you haven't been brought up, brought up to understand uh, a business. We didn't know what we were doing. And in fact, John Hare, who was speaking uh, an hour or so ago, uh, quite clearly, you listen to him, he's saying more or less the same, more or less the same thing. He, he, was, uh, he saw himself as a musician. Uh, and uh, actually, we had to learn an awful lot of um, different business skills uh, apart from anything else. So the transition from 8-bit to 16-bit, yeah, was definitely a challenge. I think it's... Um, on the one hand, when you've developed a, a reputation in one medium uh, and one set of hardware, to have to move uh, that reputation to another set is difficult. Uh, and also because in my case, as you mentioned early on, our strength was innovation, really. Uh, you know, we were only interested, I was only interested in, 
games that were really pushing the boundaries and doing something new. That was really what turned me on. I didn't like, like doing things that other people had done. Um, and maybe that's arrogance. I don't know. You can't help being who you are. So um, actually, the, the way to transition from the 8-bit to the 16-bit was, of course, take your 8-bit eight, eight products and port them onto the 16-bit. The 16-bit machine, by definition, ran a lot quicker. Therefore, the ports could be made to work. Uh, therefore, you could make some more money out of, uh, of uh, porting the games. Therefore, that's the, uh, that's the way to go. And there were a lot but, bigger games as well, I imagine, though. Did they take a, more resources? Yes, of course, that's the other half of it. It is that um, uh, the more... Uh, the, um, the, the bigger machines, more memory, the, the, the higher the speed they are, the more you can get in there, and therefore the bar gets raised as to what you've got to put in. Uh, and you can, again, you can see that in the modern world, where I am stunned by the graphics, the quality of the graphics, and the amount of work that has to go into those graphics. I mean, they are phenomenal these days, aren't they? Well, they're tremendous. Uh, and to be honest, almost all the work of the game is now graphics, uh, which again, from my point of view, is a bit of a dis disappointment, because you know, in terms of graphics, am I interested in them? Not very much, sorry. I'm just impressed. Why did Houston close down in 1991? Yeah, we uh, basically, ha, you know, that's a horrible story, horrible story, but by this time we were like John Hare was, uh, exporting our products all over Europe. We had good di distribution net network, uh, everywhere. Germany was our biggest market. 25% of our sales uh, went to Germany and our German distributor rang me up uh, one day out of the blue and said, uh, I'd like to meet you in London. Oh, okay. You know, so nip up to London to go and see him. Nice posh hotel. Uh, upstairs to his room. No, it's not a room. It's a suite. You know, I was, I, and I, again, I was young enough in those days to be impressed by somebody who got a suite, you know, like there's the bedroom and there's the living room area as well, but in a separate room. Uh, the, I'd never seen anything like that before, didn't realise that sort of thing existed. Took me to his suite, sat me down, and I'm thinking, oh, we've got another deal going on, have we? You know, what's coming on? Sitting forward, and he, and he said, uh, I'm sorry, we're having difficulty paying people. What? Well, you know, we owe you a lot of money, but we're fine. We're gonna, we're gonna, we can't, we can't, we can't all together. We're, um, we haven't got the money. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> now that actually wasn't the conversation that I, I sort of imagined on the train uh, going up to see him. So, um, the, and that was a that was a big blow. That was a big blow. We, financially, we were stretched at that time. We were do, we were making this transition to the 16-bit machines. We were investing. Uh, money in product development. We were in hock to the bank because that's how that's how any manufacturing company is always. Uh, you know, I understand it much better now than I did then. Um, far better. Uh, you know, we were we we were owed, owed money to the bank, uh, and oh, we can't pay your bill. And I went back home, and I, the mistake I made actually, and I've said it to Rob. Uh, the mistake I made was to go to that meeting on my own. If I'd gone along with somebody else, I'd have had somebody to talk to about it, but I didn't went on my own. And I thought, uh, by the time I got back home, I thought, we've got to close the company. You know, we've got to face up to this. We can't run away from it. We can't, he's not going to pay us. We're not going to pay our bills. We're in hock to the bank. We've got to close it down. If I'd had somebody else there, I'd have talked it around, around some more um, and actually, of course, you only realise it afterwards. We could have worked our way through it. We could have actually put, uh, worked our way through it, but we didn't. Well, out of the ashes of Hughes and Consultants came 21st Century Entertainment. How did that come about then? Well, somebody came along to me. A friend of mine came along a few weeks later, uh, uh, three weeks into the, uh, the liquidation, and said, sorry to hear about what, uh, what happened. What would it take to get you back on the road? And, of course, I was looking around for something to do at this point. Uh, and I said, this much money, you know, picking a number out of the air almost. Um, the, um, and, he, uh, and he said, oh, it doesn't sound too much. And he went away and raised it. And um, so we set up a new company, 21st Century Entertainment. And this time, did I, do you think I've got a better name? Yeah. Was it a better name? <laughs> Hands up those who think it was a better name. Yeah, me. The, um, the, uh, yeah. Uh, and then, uh, of course, 
Um, once uh, 21st Century Entertainment exported quite a lot to the US uh, because we were in pinball, uh, and the uh, our US um, agent, uh, a, this is a year or two later, explained to me that in the US, 21st Century Entertainment is not a very good name. It would be better if it was software. Entertainment implies the porn industry, apparently, in the US. So we didn't get it entirely right. Uh, but yeah, 21st century, uh, that's how it started up. It was, um, it was a fortuitous meeting with somebody who um, uh, was significantly older than me. He's, he's gone now. He, uh, he's, he's dead. So, um, but he was very shrewd and he'd made his money out of building um, uh, industrial units. Just industrial units on old uh, petrol station sites. Now, there's a funny business to be in. Find me a petrol station site and I'll put you an industrial unit on it. Okay. Well, you mentioned pinball there as well, and pinball was like an absolutely massive genre. Yeah. So y your first release was uh, Pinball Dreams with the DICE team. How, di how did that work? Yeah, the, well, actually it wasn't the first release, but we had, we had a few other products before it. I mean, a year into the existence of 21st Century Entertainment, Pinball Dreams came out. Uh, and it was a fabulous, it was a fabulous game. We picked it up from some Swedish developers. Uh, this is the advantage of going to exhibitions, you meet people. Uh, and um, the, uh, the, the Swedish developers, I mean, as soon as I saw it, to be honest, I knew this was a sexy product. I mean, you know, even I'm not quite that thick, if you know what I mean. It was, it was very obvious. Um, and uh, it was tremendous. Uh, it had everything. It had pinball and you've got a pinball arcade out here haven't you so pinball is well known and of course the nice thing about uh, about that is having a product that people recognize what it's for um, and pinball says it all and nobody owns the word pinball uh, whereas other brands people own nobody owns pinball anyone can use the name uh, so pinball dreams came out and it was fabulous product great graphics wonderful music, wonderful sound effects. I still have, I can still hear the, the, on the uh, nightmare table, the ni there we are, I've got somebody nodding, the nightmare table, which is set in a churchyard, you know, it's a, it, uh, it's a black, gothic. And I still hear the bell tolling, ding. I can't do the sound, obviously, I can't do sound effects. But what a fabulous sound effect. You feel like the end of the world has come when you hear that bell uh, ringing. So, uh, yeah, and uh, we, sold, uh, we sold literally thousands and tens of thousands of units of uh, Pinball Dreams and we ported it to other platforms. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it uh, made our fortunes for a while. And, of course, that's another thing about the industry you're in. You only make your fortune for a while and then it stops. And that's what happened. Well, it was a very technically advanced game. I mean, I, I've got vivid memories of seeing that ignition table. The first time I saw that, I was like, this is like a real pinball machine. Yeah. I mean, you must have blown your mind, Rob, when you were a kid, did it, <laughs> seeing that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, I certainly remember Pinball Dreams, Pinball Fantasies coming, coming home and uh, playing on those over the entire weekend. And uh, Dad actually setting a challenge. The producer on um, Pinball Dreams at 21st Century was um, Barry Simpson and uh, he had the best score. So uh, me and my sister spent the entire weekend beating his score, um, came screaming down the stairs, we've beaten Barry's score, uh, and gave dad a rather cheeky note, how old was I, what was this, 92, so I was about 11 or something like that, giving dad a cheeky note to take back into Barry, basically mocking him, and dad pinned it on the office wall in, uh, at 21st century. Um, and then a couple of weeks later, uh, I was in Tesco's with mum, you know, doing the weekly shop or whatever, and well, oh, we bumped into Barry, oh, hi, Barry. And, um, and, and Barry, you know, just had a nice conversation with my mum and then went to walk away and then turned around and went, oh, Rob, uh, yeah, 100, 124 million. And he basically doubled my score, so uh, I got my, uh, got my comeuppance from that. Well, after Pinball Dreams, it was Pinball Fantasies, which was, I think, you know, for me, the highlight of the series. And the Pinball Illusions, I think, came after that as well, didn't it? I mean, you owned the pinball scene in the, in the 90s. You must be really proud of those games, looking back. Well, of course proud. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And really, uh, it was good for my karma. It, was, it, it, was, uh, it, it really made up 
uh, in some ways. It never, nothing could quite makes up for the collapse of the previous company. To be honest, you know, there's still a scar uh, even today. But it, yes, it certainly went some way towards making me feel better about myself, principally because having had the stroke of luck, and that's what it was, folks, the stroke of luck to sign Pinball Dreams, and knowing how to put it on the market, of course, uh, but that's just one of those things. Uh, then having the sense to say, we're going to do this again and again. Uh, I, I said to them, we can, we can sell the same engine again, just give me three obvious improvements. Three obvious improvements from Pimble Dreams to, to Pimble Fantasies. Why three? I don't know. Uh, three is always the magic number, isn't it? You know, it's da, 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 da. It's always three. It's always three. Give me three obvious improvements. And there are three obvious improvements in, um, between Pimble Dreams and Pimble Fantasies. There's an extra flipper. You know, so instead of, just, instead of just two at the bottom, you know, there's one up here. Uh, there's an extra flipper. Obvious improvement. Uh, the, col the colours are significantly better. They're brighter, more vibrant. Uh, obvious improvement. <laughs> and, of course, delightfully, uh, because that, this tells you how long ago we're looking, it's got a dot matrix display, a simulated dot matrix display. Now, in those days, that was an improvement. Uh, the, uh, you know, so those are the three obvious improvements. Another four tables, and we sell the same engine again. But then with Pinball Illusions after that, you had Multiball, didn't you? I remember we had that yeah, yeah, and Pinball Illusions was the same developers rewriting that engine. And in fact, it took them two years. Of course it did. Of course it did. Uh, and, that's the, uh, and that's the reason we were going elsewhere to find other Pinball products, because we wanted to own that slot in the market. Well, talking about bright and colourful games, Marvin's Marvelous Adventure was one of my kind of favourite Amiga games because I always wanted a Mario-type game on there, and that was like Mario Plus. <laughs> Could you tell us more about that? Yeah, and Barry Simpson uh, would... Uh, it was probably his favourite game of all time. He put a lot of effort into helping with, uh, as the producer on that to get the development through. And, of course, it's a great game and how many people know it today. Uh, and that's the real commercial issue at the heart uh, of, um, uh, of all of this product development, is how do you, it, it's not actually about developing a great game, it's about finding the way to not only develop a great game, but find the demand in the market. Because of course, uh, what you've got to do when you sell a game, it's the same as anything else, you've got to find a reason to separate the consumer from their money. Uh, and we're all consumers, every last one of us, that's how we spend 95% of our lives, is, is spending money. And we are quite careful about how, well I certainly am, about how we spend our money. And so, providing, it, trying to make it easy for the consumer to spend their money, and that's what Pinball does, and Marvin's Marvelous Adventure doesn't. You know, great game. By the way, folks, it's a great game. You should, have, you should have spent your money on it. But of course, why would you know that? I mean, that era was quite a big changing point in the industry. Because I know you did release pinball fantasies on consoles like the Atari Jaguar and the Amiga CD32. But then really, when it got to the mid-90s, when the PlayStation came along, kind of the big Japanese and American consoles really took over. And I imagine they were a lot more expensive to develop for cartridges and that kind of thing over the Amiga, for example. Yes, and the truth is, I lost the will to do it. You know, I, I really by 95, 96, I, you know, that's it. I've had it, I've done enough of this. I, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? I can either get involved in this new world uh, where you've got to um, sign up to uh, these, um, Japanese publishers, basically, okay, Sega via the States, or you can go and do something else, else with your life. And if I'd stayed in the market, what I would have done was done, would have done pinball on those platforms. And I'm sure we'd have been able to raise the money to, to do it if we wanted to. The truth is, I didn't want to do it. I wanted to get, you know, go off and have a bit of a different sort of life, which is what I've had since then, of course.
Well, 25 years later, and you're having your younger generation kind of start <laughs> taking over Houston again. So, could you explain what's happening here? Uh, not really, no. I think he's <laughs> mad. The, uh, no. Uh, of course, Robert's always, uh, um, you know, grew up with all this and ended up as a games designer and had his own uh, successful career tra trajectory. Uh, he can tell you about uh, the games that he's worked on for TT Fusion, but they are big titles. And of course, now he's working independently. And the reason he's working independently is because he's basically mad. Uh, but the, um, uh, you know, he doesn't understand the grief he's got uh, coming f uh, f through for him. Sorry about that, Rob. That's not quite the big build-up you were expecting, is it? Uh, that's pretty accurate, though, to be fair. Yeah. I mean, it is, it is hard work. Tell them what your credits are for, um, in terms of games design. Uh, well, I've worked on a lot of LEGO games. I did six, six LEGO games in four years, which tells you something about how quickly we turned those out. So, um, what were they? Uh, LEGO Lord of the Rings, LEGO Chima, LEGO The Hobbit, LEGO Batman 3, LEGO Jurassic World, and LEGO Star Wars The Force Awakens. Um, so, that's a lot of LEGO. Uh, and I did some other games before that, Hydrophobia, and the World Snooker Championship, which is... Uh, very and niche. Who did you, you got to shake hands with somebody called Steve, didn't you? Steve Davis, yes. Yeah, he was, uh, uh, we went to shoot a TV commercial and he was, um, he was there and he was a very interesting chap. Um, much more interesting than his interesting persona, um, you know, that he has on TV. He was, he was a bit more of a wide boy, actually, in real life. He's like, all right, Rob, you know. Was, uh, but yeah, that was good fun. So uh, yeah, those are some of the games I did before I went mad. Well... There's a new book that's come out in the last couple of years, Hints and Tips for Video Game Pioneers. Did you have to persuade your dad to write that book? <laughs> that's yes, uh, if we're being honest. I mean, he'll, t he'll tell you that I twisted his arm and, and beat him into submission over a number of years. But um, I think it, he didn't really um, believe that there would be much interest. Uh, I think that's fair in saying. But we, I, I think we sort of agreed that we'd give the Kickstarter thing a go. And, um, and that was successful, so then we, uh, we did the book. What's the book about then? Well, basically, it, it's uh, much the same as we've been talking about today, how, we got into the, how I got into the industry and, and the, uh, the whole uh, career trajectory. Uh, and there's lots of interviews with uh, programmers, and uh, you know, so the, there's quite a lot of um, contrasting opinions uh, in there. I think, I mean, if I was advising, well, I mean, there we are. We've got some indie developers uh, at the um, show here today. I mean, if I were an indie developer today, I would be looking for somebody like me to have in the background to talk to about what they're, what they're trying to do. Because I think it's so difficult to find your niche, because that's the really important thing as an indie developer, is to find the niche. The niche that's going to actually pay you some decent money because that's what you've got to do. Uh, and uh, to combine your dream, which Rob's obviously got, of being independent and doing it on your own, to combine that with how you're going to find your uh, money bags. Who's going to provide the money uh, to fund your dream? Now, I was talking uh, earlier on to uh, John Hare, John Hare, Sensible Soccer and that kind of thing, uh, He's just signed a deal with a company in Japan who need a soccer product. Brilliant. There you are. He's found a customer. He's found somebody who's going to pay him some money. Now he's got to go, go ahead and develop that, uh, that soccer product, which he can do probably standing on his head, to be honest, because uh, he's done it a few times. So he's found somewhere where to, ta to tap into the money that, uh, that's knocking around out there. And I think that's what all indie developers have got to do. They've got the, the, uh, and it's a case of tying down uh, your ambition, you know, which is obviously to be phenomenally successful, to identify what's going to work. Out there at the moment, there's uh, somebody who's really got fabulous graphic skills, uh, I noticed today. Now, if I were advising that person, I would be saying, find the way to exploit that, because that's your strength. Find the way to, uh, that, that's how are you going to do that? Just not dig around to work it out. 
Okay, one more from me then, I guess. I mean, gentlemen, it's been a pleasure having you on the panel. Uh, Andrew and Rob, been great getting your stories. I mean, what's, what's next for Huey Games then? Have you got anything in the pipeline? Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, just over the other side of this wall, we've got a stand and uh, we're showing the mystery of Woolly Mountain, which is another worldly adventure game created by James Lightfoot. So uh, come along and have a, have a play on that if you like... Uh, if you like uh, Monkey Island and those kinds of games, uh, then that will definitely be of interest. Um, and we've got some other projects in the works, which we're not you know, talking about just yet, which um, we're having a lot of fun with. Jonathan Port, who did Hyper Sentinel, is uh, working on something which is fantastic. Uh, and uh, it is another arcade genre game, but it's, it's a little bit different. So that's very exciting uh, at the moment. So um, yeah, we've got things in the pipeline. Excellent. Well, please give a warm thank you to Andrew and Rob Hewson.